Welcome back to Trauma is a Journey, presented by the Emergency Medical Minute. I'm your host, Elizabeth Esty, bringing you the third of four episodes. In this mini-series on rural trauma, we follow the journey of trauma patients involved in a head-on motor vehicle collision on a rural highway high in the mountains of Colorado. Unlike most rural trauma, this story took a serendipitous turn when a group of mountain bikers consisting of two emergency medicine physicians, a pulmonologist, an interventional radiologist, and a real estate developer stumbled upon the crash just moments after it happened. We have Drs. Glenn Daquan, Madison Macht, J.P. Brewer, and Dylan Loyton, and we're especially grateful to Jeremiah Grantham for traveling from Leadville today to join us. Dr. Glenn Daquan is a regular guest on the EMM. She's a trauma surgeon and surgical intensivist at Swedish Medical Center and director of the surgery residency program there. Dr. Madison Macht is a pulmonary and critical care physician at Centura and happens to be married to Dr. Kwan. Dr. Dylan Loyton is an emergency physician and EMS physician and the medical director of the emergency department at Swedish Medical Center, and he happens to be married to me. He's also on staff at St. Vincent's Hospital in Leadville, where our story unfolds. Dr. J.P. Brewer is an emergency physician and EMS physician at Rose Medical Center in Denver. Jeremiah Grantham is a paramedic and director of the ambulance service at St. Vincent's Hospital. Deepest thanks to you all for taking the time to be here today. Maybe another shout out to ATLS. Uh, I actually was able to teach ATLS, I think it might have even been the same week or a couple of days later. And you could teach an entire ATLS course on this. And I think for emergency physicians, you know, working in, or speaking for myself, working in a level one trauma center, I have every resource and specialist, you know, at, at my elbow, essentially. Uh, this was obviously different in terms of, uh, uh, of resources. And ATLS is really w- what we did. You know, this, I think it was jarring even for us as, as an, or for me as an EMS physician, ER doc, you know, to say, okay, well, we got, we're going to get a chest x-ray. And that person, we didn't have time to get a pelvis x-ray on, and that's it. You know, and there was always still that that thought like, okay, wait, should I just get a head CT or should I just get a belly CT or or something else? And the, the right answer is no. Yeah, um, for those providers out there who have gone through ATLS, you um, – you know, when you have these sort of s- scenarios where you're tested at the end of your course or, or when, whenever it is, and they describe this scenario to you that's completely off the wall, and you're like, this, you know, I'll play along, I'll do the test. And, and it was exactly that. This was that moment. And I remember after we had left the hospital, because we had, we had dinner planned still, we were doing a little bit of a debrief. We were talking about what happened, I think, because it was, uh, we were all a little bit raw from it. And we were saying that same thing, like, we just had an ATLS scenario. Like, that was exactly what the test is right there. Can I ask a question in the group? What are we going to do differently, or what would you tell listeners to do differently in terms of being prepared for situations like this? Because, you know, uh, we were not in, in any way prepared, but we need to learn from this in some way. And, and what are we going to do differently moving forward? No clipless pedals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think you guys are prepared. I think uh, ATLS does prepare you. And I'm an ATLS course director. And the next time I direct a course, in my intro and my conclusion, I think I'll use this case as an example. I mean, you're right. Sometimes the scenarios, patient K, (laughs) just sounds really crazy. Like, when would I ever be in a situation where this would happen? And I'm sure Jeremiah could describe this. These scenarios happen to you guys in uh, rural settings not infrequently. So I think you guys, you are prepared. In ATLS, we kind of roll our eyes when we have to renew, but it does prepare you for uh, exactly this type of thing. For our non-medical listeners, Glenda, could you def- what is ATLS, JP, Glenda? ATLS is Advanced Trauma Life Support. And it is a course designed uh, to help providers uh, in any scenario to handle a trauma patient, to identify patients uh, with injuries, to take care of life-threatening injuries uh, on the spot, and then also to recognize when those patients need to be transferred to a higher level of care. And so these courses are uh, given um, across the country, and uh, we have them here at Swedish uh, four or five times a year. 
They're taught by uh, physicians here at Swedish who are trauma surgeons or anesthesiologists, emergency room physicians, and we teach a course on how to do those procedures, how to triage patients, and then how to make sure that they get the definitive care that they need. So in theory, that rheumatologist mountain biker that Madison was a little disrespectful to (laughs) could have taken this course and done just as well as you all did. The next time I'm treating Bichette's, I'm going to be haunted by this. I mean, there are (laughs) wonderful rheumatologists in Denver. Many of them are my friends. Sure. (laughs) Sure, Madison. (laughs) And I also think you might want to do some damage control on Peter Horner's, I believe you said, small skill set? Um relatively not applicable. Um, It should bear notice that he is a phenomenal photographer. Um, He has, uh, he had many of his gadgets were uh, photography devices and he documented everything. Um, And I will say he made the comment, which uh, still I laugh about, which is put me in coach, you know, (laughs) give me a spot. (laughs) And if he hadn't lost his cell phone, let's talk about fate and bigger questions. If he hadn't lost his cell phone, you guys would have been head on possibly with this driver who lost consciousness for, I'm not sure why. And and we we either would have driven past the event, uh, you know, and and five minutes uh, behind us, it would have happened. Or perhaps more hauntingly, uh, we would have been the car involved. I just want to uh, give another shout out to Peter in this regard. He, like many things in his life, he was just ahead of his time. <laughs> if um, if it was two hours post this event, he could have been in the in the embolization suite doing the interventions for the pelvis that was bleeding. So he was there and ready. He he just needed a suite to to intervene. So true. Following up on the earlier question, also about preparedness. I mean that there is a whole like. Uh, study of what is your emergency jump kit. And I'd love to hear from Jeremiah about his perspective about that. I do carry a stop the bleed kit in my car. I do think, you know, yeah, Dr. Kwan has two in her vehicle. I think that's very smart. I mean, we, we think about this constantly in emergency medicine and, and in EMS. What do you actually need? And we know uh, that uh, obviously tourniquets are incredibly important. But I do think the preparation was our preparation. You know, we we fundamentally as a team communicated well. We fundamentally understand just some basics of scene management and prioritization and trauma. It, we know what sick looks like. I mean, I think we've talked about this a bunch as, as a, a group after this. You know when you see someone, and we all saw this woman and said, she's dying right now. She's about to die. We know what that looks like, and I think that recognition and situational awareness is maybe the single most important thing. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about sort of how you keep yourself calm in these situations. Uh, You know, an incredible body of work, uh, this guy, Lieutenant Grossman, uh, famous for the book, I think it's called On Combat, which is pretty amazing about how to do self-talk and how you can sort of essentially almost like biofeedback techniques to keep yourself your mind still and focused you know you do as it said it's 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 a trite but it's true we do just regress to our training and i i do find personally when i find myself overwhelmed as i did here i literally just say to myself a b c i literally come back to that and i did that in this case ABC, you don't mean that you self-soothe with the alphabet. You mean airway, breathing, circulation? Yeah, so the preparation is, 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 is that maybe more than anything else. I don't know what medical equipment we could have had. You know, I mean, you could say, I mean, obviously tourniquets in the right situation are truly life-saving and, and also truly portable. I think some docs carry BVMs, you know, bag valve masks in their rigs. Some, some docs have an oral airway. Some docs have dressing supplies. Uh, some docs have a crike kit. You know, people have kind of the full gamut of gear. Jeremiah, what do you think? This is a, a question we deal with in EMS all the time. I mean, I, I've, I've had this conversation, I don't know how many times in my career. Um, and it, it becomes down to, yeah, do we have the equipment we need to do things in the field when we aren't even on duty. To me, like Dr. Kwan was saying, the the knowledge, the the mental preparedness, the, the behind all of those things are far more important than the equipment that you carry. 
the more equipment that you carry with you in the field, the more of a legal battle we get into. You know, especially us in the EMS field, we have to work under medical direction. I have to be, I have to have online medical direction to do my job. If I'm not under online medical direction, if I'm not on duty, uh, I have, I have nothing. I have nothing. I have no backup. And so I'm, I'm a, a good Samaritan at that point. Um, and so while I have all this knowledge, if I carry all the equipment, I can get myself in some real trouble. And so there's a, there's a legal component to that as well. But I, I personally run into that all the time myself is, you know, I, I've, I've run into car accidents uh, off duty or seizure patients off duty or whatever and, and struggle with, you know, I have this knowledge. I know what to do, but I don't have the equipment to do it, you know, and, and where's the fine line in there about, uh, about how we can manage that. Could you explain to me, I don't understand what you mean, the more equipment you have, the more medical legal risk you carry? Sure. So if, you know, if I carry a stop the bleed kit and put on a tourniquet, if, um, if I carry a BVM or pocket mask and do a little bit of airway management, that's probably willing to be covered under Good Samaritan laws. But if I start carrying intubation kits, IV kits, uh, crite kits, all those things, there's far more complications that can come with those procedures, which means I put myself at a far more legal risk of being sued, those things going wrong. And, and like I said, I'm not covered in medical direction at that point, and it becomes a big, big issue. And in, in, as I asked the question, I, I think one of the most valuable things that we had was the ability to communicate in, a, in an effective manner. And I remember JP introducing himself to complete strangers, and Jeremiah, you and I didn't know each other before this event. And uh, very quickly, like in the matter of seconds, JP and the uh, collective group around the bedside were uh, teammates. And that is the skill that you're right. There's no equipment. There's no piece of plastic that allows you to do that. And secondly, Dylan's ability to introduce himself as a, a person of the medical community of this, this small rural place, that's the most valuable commodity that we had. Just curious question to you all, really. How often have you experienced that sort of teamwork gone wrong? You know, too many cooks in the kitchen, competing leaders, and just a total shit show. I won't say that it's frequent or often, but I think, um, I mean, we are, all of us, I think, are involved in resuscitations, different versions of resuscitations at all times. And, you know, this is an ATLS comment. This is an ACLS comment. There's this concept of, like, early on you sort of say say your roles or sort of establish what your roles are. And so in your training moments, you sort of you sort of snicker at it, but it, it turns out it's it's really important. And so I have I've been in countless resuscitations where there really isn't guidance t- to what's going on. And they do they they you sort of fumble through things and everybody knows the next step that's supposed to happen. But, you know, it, it just doesn't seem as uh, choreographed. And so in those, you know, what, what I've kind of learned from those is the more we can communicate, the better off we are. And, you know, this maybe speaks to Dylan's point of you sort of regress to your training. I had a chief resident who, you know, when, when we were carrying the, the code pager in the hospital, would run in the room and stand on a chair and say aloud who he was and what his plans were for the next sort of step in that resuscitation. And so th- that concept, I think, is super important. It's, it's not uncommon that I think we're involved in these situations where something bad is happening. A lot of people are there willing to help and know kind of the things that have to happen, but getting them to happen in the correct order is, is difficult to do. Yeah, I felt like, I mean, I'm often the person who's the loudest in a room, and so it may just naturally, like, <laughs> Glenda's laughing, uh, having done many resuscitations together. But, uh, but I think that was true. I mean, I didn't, after I got out of the ambulance, uh, I didn't really do a lot of direct patient care. You know, I, I felt like my role here was best if I could try to progress these patients on their journey. So establishing how we were going to get them out of there, um, getting the crews launched correctly, getting, you know, Glenda and her team prepared. I remember looking at the room and my vision of this patient's journey was being intubated and getting out. And I remember saying to you, JP, just intubate him. And, you know, I think one could, you know, do post hoc analysis on that as to whether it was absolutely necessary. I don't know, but there's definitely something in having a, a leader who just says, 
you do this. I remember the same with Renee, just Renee do that thing and staying back. And I felt like I was, thankfully, we had enough bodies and enough perspective to, to have somebody in that role who just sort of is driving the resuscitation. I had said this to, to Dylan and Madison too, when we were talking about this and I, the, the, the following, I don't know, two or three days later, I was discussing some of this with some residents that I was orienting. And ultimately we were having this conversation of sort of roles and leadership in just all resuscitations in general. And, and I did, I said something to the effect of sometimes you're the floating head in the room that's making these decisions. And sometimes you're the technician. And I think both are equally as important and there's many, many more pieces uh, or roles, but it, I remember feeling some, some comfort in sort of, I can do these things. And I kept sort of looking to Dylan to say, what's the next thing we just need to get done? Or what's the next thing I can do to sort of, sort of move this along. And I think that that is a, that's a leadership thing, but that's a team thing. And that's how great care always kind of happens in all settings. I have to agree with Dylan. Um, As a trauma surgeon, we have a unique perspective, I think, because, you know, we take care of the patients or we're involved in the patient care from the minute they you know, sometimes straight from the scene to the trauma bay. And I'm always at the foot of the bed and I rarely touch the patient. You know, I'm trying to coordinate care. I'm trying to get the patient to the CT within 30 minutes. And the end of my journey is the patient goes to rehab, right? So I'm already like, how am I gonna get, how am I gonna advance this patient's story over the next three to seven days here in the hospital to get them out of the hospital and home to their families? Um, and so we're kind of involved from the minute the patient hits the trauma bay to the discharge summary when they leave to go home. And people pop in and out of the story. So I see Dylan in the emergency department, and you know, then I see orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons and then PT and OT. And so people come in and out at different points, but somebody has to be driving that story from beginning to end to make sure that the patient you know, gets, to the, gets to the ending, that, that they, the best ending that they can have. It's so important to think about the full scope of the journey these patients have ahead of them. However, in the heat of initial stabilizing care, there's often no time to think about long-term outcomes. As we've seen here, you just have to fix the problems in front of you with the resources at hand. Can you tell us more about the role of duct tape in emergency medicine? I'll just say, and we've touched on it, the importance of kind of not you know, being distracted by the obvious injury, which in this case was multiple long bone fractures and multiple patients, and focusing on the thing that they'll die of, which is hemorrhagic shock. But I had just that much more respect for the difficulty on scene for EMS. You know, I I think I'm not uh, um, immune to sometimes I've probably rolled my eyes at a crew who showed up with a obvious femur fracture and no traction splint. And we're sort of saying, hey, where's the where's the Sager splint or where's the hair splint or something like that. But, you know, this was a case where I really appreciate it. It was, it would have been impossible to, to put any kind of traction splints on these individuals. I remember something I'd read once about the Israeli defense forces and how they just use duct tape and tape the legs together and, you know, put them on a, on a board. And that's exactly what we did. And I think it was, it was, uh, it's a little gruesome and graphic, but, you know, physically extricating people whose, limbs are not in continuity where there's just this sort of bag of meat where your where your legs are and obviously legs are heavy and when limbs are kind of flopping all over the place it's very physically difficult to move these people so uh, you know the the minute when that firefighter kind of opened up the the uh, case on the side of the ladder truck and pulled out a big roll of duct tape that was key for us and I remember just taking the time to ankle, you know, ankles, knees, thighs, hips together with duct tape. That was key. There was, um, I remember one time when we were in the resuscitation bay and actually I think the helicopter had arrived, but we had a little bit of extra time and I wanted an x-ray of the younger patient's pelvis. And actually we thought we have time to look at this leg as well because we had been wrestling his leg the entire time. And I think you had once you, we were in the uh, emergency department, you were able to kind of build some fiberglass splints. And, and we were trying to do some traction and build splints for the younger gentleman. And ultimately, when he was sort of with legs taped and, and still sort of in traction in that way, we had an x-ray of his femur, and it looked great. 
and and anytime you would mess with that sort of like duct tape version of traction the leg just looked really not great and it was sort of like this is just the best way to do this now let's not mess around with other things and just try to keep uh keep these bones lined up i felt like every time his leg would be released and shortened and move i was like there's a unit of blood there's a unit of blood and it was ultimately duct tape i think worked well or curlex whatever we ended up using hopefully it looked that way when it got down into the emergency department but i'm not sure and for our non-medical listeners, why would duct taping a person's bag of leg meat help that person? Well, uh, yeah. So I think um, I think the specifically in these long bones, and 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 there's better experts in the room than myself, but these long bones are are very vascular, and when fractured, can bleed substantially. And you know, the thigh specifically is a place where you can put a lot of blood, probably. And so if the bone is in alignment, in theory, you're able to tamponade some of that bleeding. In theory, you're able to kind of minimize some of that bleeding. And when it's not in alignment, the soft tissues, the meat opens up these kind of potential spaces and you can lose a lot of blood there. I don't know if, if that's the best way to say it, but I think that's what the way I like to think And for it. that rheumatologist who's gung-ho to act out, how tightly do you, like when do you duct tape the leg meat and how tightly do you duct tape the leg meat, Dr. Kwan? Uh, I think any time you have a displaced fracture, um, not only aligning the bones will, as JP mentioned, can stop the actual fracture bleeding, but it also reduces the patient's pain. And so that keeps the patient calm, keeps their blood pressure under control, and um, kind of calms the scene down as well. Like a swaddling. It is a swaddling. So you're really using the other leg as a splint if uh, you don't have a, a manufactured splint uh, on hand. Yeah, it's like like buddy taping uh, the finger to the other finger a little bit, and we just yeah, just getting the leg out to length. You know, your your quadriceps are super duper powerful, your hamstrings are super duper powerful, and th when that femur is broken, then the quads are contracting, the hamstrings are contracting, the legs foreshortening, the bones overriding. There's more bleeding, there's more pain, and as you pull everything out to length, put the ankles together, that it actually did 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 well. Join us next week for the final installment of Trauma is a Journey. We'll be talking about psychological trauma, burnout, and our clinicians' own emotional responses to these events. <laughs>